Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I always take note, try to at least, when a young man uh, does public reading for the first time. I think that was the first Sunday night that uh, Grant has read the scriptures in our assembly. And uh, Grant, thank you. A job well done. Appreciate that. Last Sunday night, we had some things to say about the topic of personal evangelism. With our recent meeting with Brother Alan Malone, and especially when he was um, emphasizing as a theme the topic of grace and evangelism, and how we've been recipients of God's grace and God's enabling power, the great grace He gives for us to do that which He wants us to do in accomplishing His purpose. And uh, He illustrated, especially on the last night, He told us several st stories about the, um, the good effects of seed being planted in Vietnam and uh, his, his labor going back there some 30 years in, in which He's uh, worked there in that area. Following the lesson, as I mentioned last Sunday night, or following the meeting, there were several actually, and I was very pleased with this, that um, in, in hearing those stories were reminded of how we have the charge also to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so there were some that were asking, just would you bring some lessons to help us in terms of, of reaching out and uh, some ways we can do that and uh, help us be equipped to do more in the way of personal evangelism. And so we uh, appreciate that. I, I love it when um, uh, there's that kind of response and uh, that those kinds of uh, requests are made. And uh, I sure do want to help. That's what I'm here for. I trust you received, and I guess this is another time I could say, if you did not receive your email that I mailed this afternoon, mailed out, what I did was to send out uh, the report that Alan Malone has given upon his arrival and just the first ab amount of work he's been able to do upon arriving there in Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh City. And so uh, you can read that at, not right now, but you can read that uh, if you haven't already when you have time. But I, I told him that I would like to share those reports uh, with you all. and. And I appreciate, again, the, the interest that you're having. And really, that is the right response to make. It's one thing for us to shed tears with a story like we heard about Maddie. It's one thing to have an emotional response when we see people thousands of miles away that are open to the gospel. And that's a good thing. But there are people in our community. There are people in our county. There are people that visit, that come to this building that we want to be aware of. And it's, it's something that we, each one of us, should, should pray about. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And if, if each of us are praying for the thing that God wants anyway, God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And if we're praying that and if we're saying, Lord, send me, Lord, use me, don't you believe that God will answer prayers like that? Amen. It could be in some uh, unexpected ways. I heard Sewell Hall tell the story, so I know it's true. <laughs> but he's telling about a woman that um, her heart was moved to want to share the gospel with others. And uh, she started praying that the Lord would put someone in her path that, that she could help teach, that, that she could bring to the gospel. And she she, she started praying that, and a day goes by, and, uh, you know, she, no, no luck. She just didn't run into anybody like that. And uh, another day goes, she kept praying, and she's praying it fervently. So one day, she was pulled over by a policeman, and she knew she'd, she'd not violated uh, any, any laws. Like, officer, what are you stopping me for? I, I was not, no, he said, ma'am, you were not speeding. But he said, we have a code in this city. Now, this is some years ago. I don't know if they still have a code like this. She said, he said, we have a code in this city that uh, sh the shade 
uh, can only be darkened so much on your car. And your, your, your windows are darker than what the, 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 the law allows. He said, now I'm just going to give you a warning. But some of these fellows here, they'll, they'll write you a ticket for that. So you need, you, you need to tend to that. And she starts, she starts saying, I can't believe you pulled me over for something like that. And just, I can't believe it. I don't know why. And then she goes, oh, yes. I've been praying that God would send me someone who's interested in studying the Bible. And you're the one. And she said, he says, no, no, no ma'am, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in that. Yes, I've been praying for this. That must be, that must be it. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, he said, I'm not interested. But, but my wife, she's expressed some interest in wanting to learn about the Bible. And, and, and some information was traded. And sure enough, studies were set up with a wife. And she was converted. And then the policeman that had no interest at all, well, he was converted. And before too long, he starts doing some preaching. And then others, I, I forget exactly what the number was, but it's one of those stories where it, it just continues to expand and there were several that obeyed the gospel. All because she was praying for that and took advantage of a most unlikely opportunity when it occurred. God is able. He's able to put people that are looking for truth, even sometimes if they don't know it, in contact with someone that can tell them the truth. And if, if we could just all fervently pray that, that I'm willing, as inadequate as I feel, with my own resources, I want to share the gospel. And so to pray to God that he would help us do that and put people in our path. If you know enough that you have obeyed the gospel, you may not can answer every question that would come up, but you can tell other people what you did in order to become a Christian. If you understand what you did, you could tell that to someone else and, uh, and, and start there. So the matter of prayer, that's, that's just so important. Now, I'm not going to reiterate everything we said last time. If you were, I know some of you were traveling and, uh, uh, or out of town, whatever, but if you missed that lesson, I would just encourage you to pull that up and, and listen to that. But in that you'll see that we, we talked about some principles that are helpful. And we gave Bible examples that you start where people are. The Ethiopian in Acts 8, when he asked, I meant to say Philip, as he's conversing with the Ethiopian, when he ascertained where he was, by means of conversing with him, by means of the question that the man asked, the text says this, it says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at that same scripture preached unto him Jesus. But he had to find out where he was first. Jesus made a, a different approach in, in John 3 than he did in John 4. In John 3, with Nicodemus, he just came right to the point. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's the first thing Jesus said. But with a woman at the well, he said, could I have a drink of your water? Because where he was going with that was to tell her about the water of life and to lead her to a point of faith in him who is the giver of the water of life. So you start where people are. And then we also wanted to, to, to sharpen our minds, focus in terms of, of what we're trying to accomplish. Who, what are we trying to convert someone to? And it's not to ourselves. It's not to some club, as Bill mentioned this morning about the church. We're wanting to use the word to convert people to the Lord. And so we looked at Acts 11 and saw how instructive that was in the place where the disciples were first called Christians. A lot of good information is given there. We also want to keep in mind the Great Commission has two parts. We, we teach people what is needful in order to become a Christian with the understanding you don't have to know everything, but you're making the commitment by obeying the gospel that Jesus is Lord. He has all authority. And as you continue to grow and study and learn more and understand more, you've already made the commitment that you're going to do what, whatever the Lord says. It's like I, I've heard people, here, here, here is an assembly, and here's someone obeyed the gospel uh, 40 years ago. And he said, when I did that, I knew I was going to be here this Sunday. He didn't mean in that particular place. But what he's saying is he's making the commitment. 
throughout life to do what the Lord says. So we found that that is instructive as well. So let's, let's continue further this matter of, of, as Proverbs 11 verse 30 says, He that winneth souls is wise. And Jesus told the apostles that He would make them fishers of men. And Paul's objective was he would become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. And so we're getting our heart right first. And when we get our heart right, when we get our mind right, when we are attuned to the things of God, we're we're in a better position to to be used by the Lord in in His work of of teaching others. I just want to look at some basic passages that describe where we start, that is with us. I mean, I know the question is, but how can I teach somebody else? Well, the thing is, you can't give somebody what you don't have. And if you're not burning with zeal, if your heart is not burning within you, it's going to be hard to give that to somebody else. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of Luke 24 and verse 32, when Cleopas and the other disciple that first didn't know it was the Lord, and explaining the the Scriptures to them that were fulfilled in Him, and then He vanished from their sight, although they're going to see Him later that same evening. But anyway, Luke 24, 32, Were not our hearts burning within us while He was speaking to us on the road, while He was explaining the Scripture to us? That spiritual heart burn, that yearning, that, that hunger for thirst, I mean, that hunger and thirst for righteousness, that hunger for God. If you've got that, let me tell you, that will be contagious. If you've got that, that's something that um, is a matter of being salt and being light and helping others. Over in uh, Psalm 42, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of a song that we often sing that is based upon that. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? That hunger for God, that thirst for God. As Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so, let it start with me. Each one of us, from the standpoint of of let me be that kind of person. Let me have that kind of spiritual appetite. Let me have that kind of thirst for God. I'm reminded of the words in Acts chapter 4. When, when the authorities tried to silence Peter and John. And they threatened them in Acts chapter 4. And they, they charged them. They commanded them in verse, in verse 18. Not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. This is Acts 4. Verse 19 says, Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Again, we're trying to address the question, how can we be more effective in telling others about the gospel? And what I'm saying is that passages like this are the key. If we have that attitude, we cannot but speak the gospel. What what I have learned is so precious to me. I must share it with others. I mean, you you can see that it's just not going to work if we think worship is boring. If we try to look for any for occasions, or 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 if there's a toss up, you know, where we got this other obligation. What what are we going to do? And if if we're not seeking first the kingdom of God and and His righteousness, if if other things win out, don't be surprised if you're not a very effective soul winner. It's It's the one that I cannot but speak the things which I have seen and heard. Look with me to the book of Colossians. We're studying Colossians on Wednesday nights. Colossians is a very practical book. It tells you what not to do and it tells you what to do. That whole second chapter has a lot of things where Paul is giving warnings. Aaron and I were talking a little bit about that this afternoon. Warnings about staying on the right path and not being deceived. But in Colossians 3, verse 1, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We're talking tonight about a mindset that's conducive to winning souls. Verse 2 says, 
Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Last phrase in verse 11 says, Christ is all in all and in all. Or I suppose you could put it like Paul did in Galatians 2 and verse 20. In Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm talking tonight, what's going to make us more effective that that God can use us in, in teaching others? In Romans chapter 12, in Romans 12, Just looking at two verses here. Verse 1 says, Romans 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What a great passage. Here we are living sacrifices. You know the Old Testament background would come into play because there when you brought the sheep or the goat or the turtle doves or the bullock, when you brought these animals for sacrifice, you know what had to happen. Their throat was cut. They they were bled. The, The priest received his portion unless it's a whole burnt offering, in which case the whole animal was burned. But otherwise... Uh, instructions were given, but in any case, the animal had to be put to death. And here we are, living sacrifices to God. And not conformed to the world, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, Again, as Brother Malone said, it's not so much to do that, to be seen of men, of course. That's not the purpose at all. But as men see, they can tell the difference. And what's on the inside should show up on the outside. I'll tell you, I don't know. When when someone that I have highly esteemed, that I regard as being faithful, makes use of social media. And here he is, you know, here we are, no shirt on. Uh, or, or otherwise just, I mean, here, here's a family and, and uh, just uh, bare minimum of clothing. Just, I mean, bare minimum. And nobody would look in, at that and say, that's godly. Nobody would look at that and say, that's modest. And here we just post it for the world to see. And we wonder, why, why are we not being effective in personal work? Maybe we need another program for personal work. Maybe, maybe we need some more classes. And people look at that, they're not seeing a bit of difference between a professing Christian and somebody outside of the world. What are we thinking? And if it doesn't mean practical things like that, what does it mean? Is this something you just talk about or, or is it not something we live out in what we do and don't do, in how we dress and, and don't dress, and in all manner of choices that are being made? It just seems to me that it, it makes sense that someone that's a living sacrifice and he's not conformed to the world, he's transformed by the renewing of his mind, that God can use him in a much more effective way than someone that's a bit more like a chameleon lizard when in a setting with God's people everything looks okay but you put him in the world he just blends in there just as well. I'm saying we need to start with me. We need to start with us when we talk about how to be effective in personal evangelism. Do you remember those three men that loved David? Do you remember that story, that narrative? David is in the cave of Adullam. He's in the stronghold there. He's in the cave. The Philistines, this is probably early in David's reign, because they have made inroads. They're a coastal people. They're way over into the hill country, and they have a garrison posted at Bethlehem, David's hometown. Adullam is about 14 miles away. 
due west of Bethlehem. David's in the cave. I don't know how long he had been there. The text doesn't say. But he says, uh, Oh, that someone would give me to drink from the well by the gate at Bethlehem. He's not commanding anybody to go. It's just one of those things that uh, I don't know how long he had been there. By the way, I've been to Adullam. And there is a cistern at Adullam, but there is a difference between a cistern and a well, fresh water. But that's where he grew up. And it's like, oh, that would hit the spot. Oh, that would be so good. I wish that, that wouldn't that taste good right now. But the thing is, no sooner had he said that than the text says three of his mighty men went out of the cave. And they made their way to Bethlehem. And the text says that they broke through the host of the Philistines. Just three men. That means there is fighting. That means there is battle. They broke. Here's the host. Here's a garrison of Philistine soldiers. The three men, it says, broke through the host of the Philistines. They drew the water. They had to make their way back through the line. And somehow they made their way all the way to where David was at Adullam. Here's your water. What's David going to do? Well, he was so moved by that loyalty, by their risking their lives, by their devotion, instead of drinking it, he poured it out as a drink offering before the Lord. And I've often thought, those men just, they had a one track mind. They just loved David, they just cared about David. He didn't have to command them to get some water. He wants some water. What are we doing here in the cave? They're out of there. But what if we love the Lord just half as much as those men love David? What, what kind of difference would that make? What if, what if with our life it's just, I love the Lord. Whatever Jesus wants, that's what I'm all about. That's what I want to do. It doesn't matter the cost or the risk of life or anything else. Give me Jesus. I want Him. I want to obey Him. I know that attitude, loving the Lord like they love David, is going to help equip us. And that's what you've asked about, how, how to be equipped for the work of personal evangelism. Let me give you another passage. In Titus chapter 2, in Titus chapter 2, Titus is told, Titus is a gospel preacher, and he's, he's here to address different age groups, gender groups. And I guess it's not the place to go into more than that right now. I just started to say that means male and female. That's the only gender groups there. But there's older men and younger men and older women and younger women. But then when he does that, he goes to another category. And that is in verse 9. He's talking to servants. He's talking to slaves. Because in the Roman world in the first century, there were lots of slaves, a very high percentage of the population. As much as a third of the population of Rome were slaves. Anyway, it was widespread. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now I've heard young men and young women say all manner of things when asked, what would you like to be when you grow up? A movie star, a fireman, a policeman, an actress, a mother. I've heard all kinds of things people want to be when they grow up. You know what I've never heard? I've never heard somebody say, well, when I grow up, I'd like to be a slave. You ever heard anybody say that? I, I'd like to be a slave. Nobody would want that. But he's talking about or talking to people that are in a strata of society that nobody would want to be, but they were stuck there anyway. And he says, you live in such a way that you adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. What does that mean? Adorn. Well, it means to make something attractive, to make it appealing. Now, that doesn't mean we do something to change the gospel. How do you adorn the doctrine? He's saying, in your life, when you do these things he's, he's speaking of here, 
showing faithfulness, not stealing something, not answering back, not just doing your work when the, when the master's there, but working unto the Lord is the idea. You're making the gospel attractive. And here's somebody that is in a position nobody would ever want to be, and Paul is telling Titus, you instruct that kind of person to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. And that's really the charge that we have. We need to adorn the doctrine. The gospel becomes adorned, it becomes attractive when we're living it, when we're truly Christ-like, when Jesus is really seen in us, when it can be told, when it can be seen that we have been with Jesus, that is adorning the doctrine of God, our Savior. And that puts us in the position that's anticipated in 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, there when Peter says in verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And well, the passage continues. But this is anticipating people are asking you. What are they asking you about? Well, the text says, everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And that tells me something right there. This is what people are seeing. That's why they're asking about that. Now sometimes the turn people make on the passage, which is a legitimate point of application, there's nothing wrong with making this observation, but they're saying, well, according to this passage, you need to know what you believe and why you believe it. If there's a Bible answer, you, a question, you need to give a Bible answer, book, chapter, and verse. Well, all that's true. But Peter's really specifying to give an answer, the word is apologia, a defense, to anyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you. It becomes apparent that you have something here. You're living in a different way. That There's a hope that you have. And they're asking about that. What is it that makes you different? The idea is they're seeing something that you have and it's attractive. They want to know more about it. And so that's, that's really the, the challenge for us, really. There, instead of it just being kind of an out of the blue thing where we say, hey, would you like to study the Bible? It's what, what's anticipated in this passage is living in such a way. You, you just handle things differently. There, there's some calmness that you have. There's some steadiness you have. It's apparent you have an anchor no matter what's going on. I, I'm, I'm seeing something in you that I don't, or, don't ordinarily see. Tell me something, you know, what's going on with you? And isn't that what you see the text is saying, that there's the anticipation that someone's asking a reason for the hope that is in you? Well, let me talk a little further about this matter. You're wanting to teach someone the gospel. How do you get prospects? And I just want to say a word, a little bit about that. I'm reminded, I mean, there's several, several areas to look. But I'm reminded of uh, years ago. Wayman, you've been up to Fayetteville, Tennessee. Wor worked up there. I was doing a gospel meeting. This has been 20 years ago or more. I was up at uh, South Fayetteville at that congregation doing a gospel meeting. Had not been there before. And uh, they had a, a whiteboard. You know, not a chalkboard. Not a, it was a whiteboard. And so I get there and there's nothing on that whiteboard except somebody had written TV, the letters TV. Well, you know what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, well, they've, they've been talking about television, you know, a waste of time to watch so much stuff or, or whatever, managing your time better. I didn't, you know, I didn't know what to think. I just see TV. And so I asked the preacher about that. I said, what, what is this TV business? What, what is that about? Because it was just those two letters. I saw it was on the whole board. And he says, that stands for Think Visitors. It's reminding us that when we have visitors to our services that we are to think in terms of those visitors. And he said, instead of, instead of first just speaking to our friends and getting caught up in conversations and getting tied up with that, before we do any of that, we think about those guests. We think about the visitors that have, that have come. And maybe they're first time visitors. That they're showing an interest. And so we, uh, we're encouraging them to put that first, to, to see them, to greet them, make them feel welcome, that sort of thing. I thought, well, that's pretty good. 
TV, think visitors. It's easy for us to not think visitors. Remember another gospel meeting I was doing in Northwest Alabama. Good people, good congregation, a work that's done a lot of good over the years. I was doing the gospel meeting, the lesson was over, and, and as I enjoy doing, I walked to the back so that I could speak to everyone that would be on their way out. I don't think we had as many zillion doors as we do here, but I, I was speaking to people as they, uh, as they were coming out. And I, I was kind of waiting a while because they were kind of gathered, you know, in the building. And so I'm, I'm waiting. And a good friend of mine who's now deceased, Johnny Richardson. Did you all know Johnny, some of you? Johnny Richardson. Some of you knew him. So he's in the area. He's preaching for another congregation. You know him, Brother Brittnell. And so here, here Johnny and I were speaking there in the back. And a good little while, you know, several minutes passed. And I had not really noticed what he's about to say, but it was a fair point. He said, uh, he said, you know, <clears throat> what's happening right now is the reason this church is not growing. He said, now, I know these people. I love these people. And it's not hurting my feelings. But he said, if there's another visitor here, and, and, and he was coming out as I am right now, and here they are down there just kind of all talking to each other, he said, they'd probably never be back. And he, he said, that's, that's one reason they're not going to be growing. Well, I don't know that I could argue with that. It, and that's not a case, those are not good people. <laughs> they are good people. But it's just, it's just what we unintentionally slip into. That, that here's someone that maybe has never been to a service before. And he's honoring us with his presence. And he's had to get out of his comfort zone. A little bit of nervousness there. Doesn't know what's going to take place, but, but you know, maybe overcoming some timidity in some cases, he's visiting. Maybe kind of sitting toward the back. Most likely is. And then pretty soon after services are over, just kind of may gingerly kind of make his way on out. And if we're all just engaged with our friends, turning around talking to our friends, he's just going out the door and... Um, Somebody might say, did you, did you speak to our visitor? And you might say, what visitor? And all the while we're asking, how can we be more effective with personal evangelism? Well, if there's someone right here in our assembly, we need to think visitors. Don't, don't you think that we should make someone first feel welcome and find out some information? I don't mean 125 people converge on one person and embarrass him or her to death. I don't mean that but to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves so that a person is made to feel welcome so that at least several of us are, 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 are meeting each, each new guest that we have. So TV, think visitors and put that first before you just turn around. I remember reading someone was, was talking about um, visiting at a congregation. I don't even remember where it was or didn't even know the people. I just remember what they said. I was reading where somebody said, uh, I visited at such and such a church, and nobody even spoke to me. And the person they were relating to said, well, I'm very surprised at that, because I know that congregation, and those are very friendly people. And the person telling the story says they were friendly. They were real friendly to each other. And any of us can fall into that trap, where we're real friendly to each other, and we're letting visitors just slip and prospects just slip right through our fingers. So think, think visitors. And really, what I'm talking about even begins in the parking lot. I don't know if any of you knew about this, but when there's a long period that uh, Sister Donna Minor and her mother, they were not attending. And uh, Donna first, and then her mother made the decision to come back and to be restored and to be faithful and worship again with us here. And Donna was very nervous. And it was Connie Allen. When Donna got out, was getting out of the car, Connie Allen was still out there and welcomed her. And Donna told me how that, that made it. She said, I was so nervous. And then Connie just made me feel so welcome. See, what we're talking about really, it begins in the parking lot. It's just having that mindset, having that desire, having that open eye and, and looking. But we need to look at 
fellow employees. I'm not just trying to tell one story after another, but I'll tell you, it does remind me of a lot of things. I talked to a fellow one time who had retired from a, one of the factories in Birmingham. I forget now which one it was. But he had worked in the same area, almost shoulder to shoulder. This fellow was a member of the church, and he had worked there for years and years and years, and finally it came out that the person working next to him was a member of the church. Now as I say, we, you know, we can hear a lesson on personal evangelism by Alan Malone and say, yes, that's, you know, I, that's, that's wonderful. But you're working with somebody day in, day out for years and the spiritual matters have never come up. So we, we look into, and I don't mean taking the employees, the employer's time and, and, and that sort of thing and, and, and doing things that are unethical that way. But, but surely there are times when people we work with that, uh, again, if, you're, if we're adorning the doctrine, that the topic can come up. Do we have relatives that have not obeyed the gospel? Friends? Everyday contacts. This is the kind of thing that we have to look at. There, every one of us here has a sphere of influ influence. Now I know that sometimes that people, especially pre-COVID, I don't know how much of this has happened since COVID, but I, I know sometimes the, the, the people have saturated a community, passed out uh, uh, invitations and time of services, little cards, and, and that does good. It's letting people know there's a congregation here. And door knocking, just cold turkey door knocking has done a lot of good. But that's not where your best prospects are. I was reading a, an article one time about how the Mormons grow. And they are the door knockers. They spend a lot of time door knocking. But the way they grow is contacts they've made, personal influence, extended family members, friends, where there's some influence there along that line. And that's really, that's really what we need to, to, to see, that, that people that are within our sphere of influence, those are people that are in our path. And let me tell you, we have a lot of people here tonight that are new converts. And you have friends. Some of the most effective personal workers are young people. Young people that invite people to services. Young people that, that invite people to study. And so it's a matter of getting out of that comfort zone and, and moving past how that we feel insufficient and realizing that our sufficiency is not of ourselves, it is of the Lord. Now, I felt that in all fairness I should include, well, well what about materials? What about um, equipment? And there, I, I think we should try to find out what works best and what the person's comfortable with that we're trying to, to study with. A lot of people have been effective. Men that I know have, uh, in, in various places, have just asked someone if, if they'd read the Bible with them. Just, would you be willing for us to read the Bible together? And a lot of people have read through Luke and through Acts. Luke, the life of Christ, Acts, plan of salvation, the establishment of the church, and a lot of people have come to the Lord that way. But, but again, it's, it's making use of the contacts that we have. Have you thought about how the Gospel of John is the Gospel of come and see? Look with me to John chapter 1. In John 1 and verse 39, disciples of John were following Jesus, and Jesus said, What do you seek? John 1 38. And Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. I look later in John 1, verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. What if Philip had not said, come and see? 
But he said, come and see. And Nathanael came, and as you continue to read the chapter, you see that confession of faith in verse 49, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Last week we talked about the woman at the well. Do you know that she said, come and see? After her conversion to the Lord, after her point of faith. In John 4, in John 4, in verse 29, she said this, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I've done. This is not the Christ, is it? And then they invited Jesus to stay for two days, and he did. And many came to a point of faith in him as you continue to read the chapter. Come and see. Just, just the power of saying come. Come and see. Sometimes something that simple. Come and see. Would, would you come with us? Come and join us. Would, would you be willing to, to study with us? I'll tell you, it kind of doesn't matter. Some people have studied correspondence courses. Dave Bradford was very effective. He had four sheets. This is back in the days, I know some, I've, he, he shared that with me, and I know that these were mimeographed. Do any of you, do any of you know what a mimeograph is? You look so blank when I'm asking you that. See, they don't even know that. That's for another time. But these, it's, it's not just before computers. I mean, it's, it's way back. But he took those sheets, and, and, and it, was, it was just a passage and A, B, C, or D. Just, just real simple. But, but he, he told me that he, he, kept, he kept that sh lesson number one. He, he'd keep several with him all the time. No telling how many, many people. He, he studied with uh, like that. I personally like to start out if, if someone's willing to do that. Because so many people don't have this, I, I like to start out with an overview of the Scripture. And I can do it in about 40 minutes to start from beginning to end. And most every time the reaction is predictable. Wow, I've never seen it that way before. And so just, just to that first lesson, but then I will immediately follow up on that with the Great Commission, the plan of salvation, obedience to the gospel, and go from there. And again, depending upon where we are at that point, but I, I like to just have an open Bible and, and a pad and writing. But it, it's, it's whatever you're comfortable with. Some, there used to be the Jewel Miller film strips, and there's still... Uh, the videos available if you're more comfortable doing that. The materials are there and it'll kind of take care of itself to a certain extent. Um, Charles Goodall did an approach and he wrote a little book about it called The Same Hour of the Night and he devised a lesson that it, in one lesson he's presenting the plan of salvation. Others like to have more background and a little more information but, but here again a lot of good material is available but it's, uh, the, the point of it is the power is in the Word. And if we're living like we should, and we're praying like we should, there's going to be people the Lord will put in our path that will be willing to study. It's, it's that simple. And, and it can be in the most unexpected places. I forget now if it was Alan Yater telling me this or Bill Bynum, but one of them has saturated an area with, with Bible correspondence courses and people are just throwing them in the garbage. And there's a woman going through the garbage. They do that a lot in European countries. She's going through the garbage and she got one of those lessons and she filled it out and she was converted. So I guess one effective method is throw your correspondence courses in the garbage and see what happens. Because whoever did that, it not only resulted in her conversion, but she was instrumental in setting up numerous studies where others were converted. Harold Dowdy, he used the approach of just talking about the apostasy and how denominationalism gets started. He had an old briefcase that was filled with creed books. The problem is, in earlier time, people cared about creeds and they'd know what he's talking about. Now, th that might not be as effective, but it was effective with him. It was real effective with him. In fact, one time he got back to his hotel, the meeting was closed, and it was time he's going to leave the next morning, and he felt in his pocket and there was a contact someone had given him. And he had failed to go see that person. And he promised the one giving him the contact he'd go see that person. So he called the local preacher and he said, I'm, I'm sorry about this, but I promise, can we go? And so even though it was after services and a little bit late, they, they make their way to the house and actually woke the woman up. And she came to uh, the door with a house coat on. 
I mean, modestly dressed, but she had her house coat on. And so they, they, well, your name was given to me as someone that would perhaps like a visit and like to study. And she said, well, come on in. The two of them, everything was, you know, okay that way. And that night she obeyed the gospel. And it was not until he got back home and looked at that again, he realized he'd gone to the wrong address. But he prevailed upon her in terms of this, this someone's given me your name, this is urgent. And she was receptive. So, let's pray. Let's think. Let's be the kind of person that draw people to the Lord. And above all things, not be so thoughtless that, that we're doing those things that are going to shut a door to the gospel. We don't want to do that. You, you, you may think that your fries at McDonald's are cold. And I'm right with you on that. I don't like cold fries. And so you've got your rights. And you can just ball out that person at the counter. And when you get through with that, would you say, by the way, I'm a member of the Hansville Church of Christ. Would you like to have a Bible study? Could I invite you to our gospel meeting? See how that works for you. Or blast some business out on Facebook and then ask them to come to your services. Or do you mind if I put a poster up in your window? Would that be okay? A lot of times we may have a point. We may, we may be in a way right about what we're saying. But think about that. Because if we're shutting a door to the gospel, we're doing immeasurable harm that's so far worse than any point we might have made or some, something that we have, might, might have proved by standing up for our rights there. Well, you've listened patiently, and I thank you for that. May God help us to be soul winners for the Lord. If you've not yet obeyed the gospel, we encourage you this evening to make things right with the Lord. Let us help you, and um, all things are ready. Make your way to the front as we stand and sing.